Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Left, Right and Center. I'm Nidhi Razdan. Well, in just a few days from now, the world is going to witness a historic transition when Donald Trump takes oath as President of the United States. Words we thought we'd never hear or say, but in fact, that is something that is happening that's going to happen on the 20th of this month. This has repercussions, not just for the American people, but for all of us all around the world. And many believe that it also has huge repercussions this year in particular for Europe, where we have crucial elections in countries like France, like Germany and the Netherlands. And in all these countries, there are popular populist right wing parties, far right parties that could actually get a boost as a result of Trump's victory. Over the next one hour, we'll be taking a look at what a Trump presidency is going to mean for the United States, what it will mean for the world, what the rise of right-wing nationalist governments in Europe means for all of us. And certainly, we will reflect on Narendra Modi's government here at home as well and how it fits in to the world order today. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. We have a terrific panel on the show with us today. We have Shashi Tharoor, of course, uh, Lok Sabha MP from the Congress Party, author, politician, former civil servant, also with us. Bernadetta Berti, who's a fellow at the Institute of National Security Studies, a TED Senior Fellow, a Robert Fox Senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and so many other wonderful uh, achievements that have been listed out here. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. David Malone, uh, who is uh, uh, with the United Nations University, who's also served as president of Canada's International De Development Research Center. Uh, also with us, uh, Sean Canuck, very interesting uh, background. He's a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and a globally recognized cyber expert advising governments, law firms, and corporations on the nexus between technology, law, and security. And Samir Saran from the Observer Research Foundation, the vice president of the ORF, who frequently, of course, uh, talks on global policy issues. Let me begin then uh, looking ahead uh, to uh, President Donald Trump. David Malone, let me start with you. Everyone has sort of written about this uh, extensively over the last couple of months, why he won, what we can expect. Now as that moment approaches, do you think we finally figured out how Trump did it? Uh, well, I think it's very clear how Trump did it, actually. He managed to capture the deep anxiety of much of the population over their stagnating standard of living, sometimes retreating job prospects, and he gave voice to these concerns. Some of his strategies may turn out not to work, but many political strategies don't work. He was a brilliant candidate in capturing this underlying anxiety, not just in the United States, but in many industrialized countries over diminishing job prospects, the quality of employment particularly, uh, that uh, many, many people in countries like the United States, my own country, Canada, and others are very concerned about. A lot of people want to migrate to your country as a result. But <laughs> I'm not sure about that. They say that before every American election, and there's rarely a tsunami of Americans turning up. Well, Sean, kind of the interesting thing, though, is we now know that Hillary Clinton actually won more than three million, uh, three million popular votes above what Donald Trump won. So in a sense, to the rest of us, she looks like she actually won the election. But because of the confusing American political system, he's the president. Uh, you know, how is that going to help him or hamper him as he goes ahead? Uh, do you see people questioning his legitimacy as president throughout because of that and other reasons? I think we've heard extreme partisan views, raising legitimacy word, but across the nation as a whole, I do think that there is a general uh, acceptance that Ms. Clinton won the popular vote. However, Mr. Trump won the electoral college vote, and as you say, it's a uh, constitutional provision in our system of government, and it may not make sense to a lot of others, but it is constitutionally accepted, and that is how the process played out. Mr. Trump succeeded under those agreed rules. And I'm not hearing extensive grassroots arguments that it was actually illegitimate. I'm hearing that he was not the most popular candidate on a per capita basis. That said, I'm actually quite pleased that we're not having the kind of legitimacy questions or real potential constitutional crisis we did back in 2000 where there were a lot of issues over what votes were actually cast. You're not hearing those kind of discussions. So, we may have a president who received a minority of the popular vote, but he's going to be accepted as the president later this week, and it'll be to see 
how he how his administration governs and what they can accomplish. Do you think he could surprise us, especially the skeptics? I think he surprised a lot of people all along. <laughs> but uh, that apart. <laughs> uh, I think as he takes office, there will be new challenges facing his management style and his personal professional experience. But I think he's going to bring in a team that will include some who are very familiar with Washington. And to his benefit, he'll be working with a Congress where both houses are dominated by the same political party that he's representing. So quite frankly, in addition to feeling uh, some comfort that it is the legitimacy of this election is probably there, I'm also comforted to think that anything that happens going forward in the new administration will be to either the credit or the accusation of the Republican Party. What they succeed or what they fail in, they will not be able to point blame elsewhere. And maybe that's a chance for some new good policies to actually reach fruition. And maybe moderating influences from those more familiar with Washington may bring some of the sentiments that Mr. Malone was describing forward in a more tempered way. I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Uh, uh, Bernadetta, uh, well, the rest of the world, though, seems to be watching with some amount of nervousness about what's going to happen after the 20th of January. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, already from, from, from what we've heard from President-elect Trump, the kind of choices he's made, uh, what do you think his relationship uh, is going to be like with, with Europe, with China, with Russia? We're already, you know, seeing major shifts. How do you see this playing out? I mean, I think this is the million dollar question. Everybody from, from, from European allies to Asian allies, from Japanese, South Koreans to India, everybody's wondering what would Trump's foreign policy actually look like? This is because if we take all the statement of Donald Trump as a presidential candidate, we combined it with all the statement Donald Trump has done since being president-elect. And then we add to this the tweets, which always surprise us with new content. Then what we have is an extremely heterogeneous set of statements. In other words, it's very hard to get a clear direction on where the administration is going to go. And I think this is creating quite a bit of anxiety amongst allies, quite a bit of instability. I think if we take all this together and we want to understand one thing about what uh, Donald Trump's foreign policies as president-elect will be like, it looks like it will be a transactional, deep in transactional foreign policy. It's going to be about what can you get, what can I give. It's going to be about concessions, bargaining, uh, short-term negotiations. Uh, it may bring some positive agility, dynamism in U.S. foreign policy and shake things up. At the same time, negotiating world peace is not like negotiating a business deal. And uh, there might be quite a bit of broken, so to speak, broken uh, glass in the China shop after this transaction of foreign policy comes to fruition. Well, you mentioned his tweeting and Shashi Tharoor is famous for his tweeting <laughs> here in India. It's sometimes gotten him into trouble. <laughs> but. Uh, you, how do you feel I about Donald that? Donald Trump had the Indian media to contend with him. He would, be, he would be in trouble. But, you know, the fact that he does tweet so freely and the way, it's an interesting aspect of the guy. I mean, you don't see a president-elect doing that. It's a new phenomenon, and we're all kind of getting used to it. I think this morning as well, he's tweeted about Saturday Night Live again and how much he hates yeah. it. But, um, how, you know, how do you see the fact that he's using the Internet the way that he is, that, that, that he tweets the way that he does? Is this something that could really backfire on him, or is this just the new normal? Well, I, th I think, you know, we're just going to have to come to terms with what the Trump presidency means. Starting off with his victory. I mean, you know, the American expression is you win some and you lose some. Now there's a third way that you can win by losing. You, know, you lose a popular vote, win the, win the election. Then he goes around uh, doing things that, you know, I remember when Obama was elected, his BlackBerry was promptly taken away from him. And uh, they said very clearly that as president, he could not have a BlackBerry until they'd sanitized it and put in all sorts of uh, cyber defenses that I'm sure uh, Sean and Samir can talk about before he was allowed to start yeah. using it for communications. But, you know, uh, what Mr. Trump does is 3 a.m. tweeting. Uh, that's going to be, um, I mean, I'd be very curious to see if that survives the 20th of January. If it does, the man is irrepressible. I don't think his style can suddenly be changed. He's going to continue saying what comes to the top of his head uh, because this notion of propriety that's implicit with an office like that that there's some things you just don't say or do as president of the U.S. clearly doesn't apply to Mr. Donald Trump. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think from the point of view of the media and for all of those who see <laughs> politics as essentially entertainment, it's a good thing because you'll really have a lot of fun watching this. But for those who worry, particularly I think those around him and in his State Department and so on, who have to explain his tweets um, to foreign audiences, who have to... Um, 
who have to defend his policies and so on, I think it's going to be a bit challenging. And I, I imagine there's going to be at least one incident a month before they finally come to some sort of settlement Understanding. as to how he's going to go It forward. is interesting. I mean, we're laughing about it, but it's actually very serious when you look at the fact that, uh, you know, the leader of the United States could be using some, he could be using something like Twitter to just freely say whatever is on his mind. Uh, from India's point of view, Samir, I mean, does this presidency really make a fundamental difference to our relations with the United States? Or do you think we're one of the few countries that can actually sit back and watch this unfold and pretty much see continuity? So I think one of the certainties in uh, the Trump foreign policy is the nature of uh, the transactional nature of his approach uh, to his partner. Then in that sense, India does offer the U.S. Uh, certain uh, economic advantages, it, be it the defense trade, be it uh, the nuclear deal when it really happens, be it the renewable sector, the technology sector. But I don't think you can make any assumptions around Trump. I think um, he's a man who's largely driven by intuition, his own personality, his own image of himself. And here I would say, Nidhi, your initial question on populism and right-wing populism and Trump may be misplaced in the case of Trump. I think he defeated two parties to become the president. He, he was an insurgent who actually took on the Republicans and took on the Democrats. And using the digital medium, he was able to evoke both left-wing uh, cadres in his, uh, to his advantage and the uh, right-wing anti-migrant um, sentiments uh, that worked for him. Uh, <clears throat> India will have to keep engaging and I think um, the good thing is that some uh, wise Indians decided to support him <laughs> and they just might become the interlocutors for the Trump presidency in India. Is it, is it uh, going to make a remarkable difference in the trajectory of the relationship? I believe uh, not really because um, there is a certain uh, traction that is built around the bureaucracies and around the realities and Trump may only um, uh, further it marginally or impede it uh, by, by a little bit, not more. David Malone, uh, just uh, you know, to, to focus a little bit more on Trump and, and his foreign policy before we move on to Europe and the rest of the world, uh, what is a potential U.S.-China conflict at this time mean, mean for the rest of the world? And we're already seeing signs of that in how Trump is dealing with China and the Taiwan issue. How should we look at this? Well, I think uh, he's opened up for debate a number of questions that had been considered settled for a long time, the one China policy, for example. Uh, and uh, this is very unsettling, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, by for allies, but it's also very unsettling for potential opponents mm -hmm. because the framework within which they are used to defining their relationship with uh, the United States and perhaps even each other is now largely gone. So uh, in that sense, it's like a new deal and we haven't seen the cards yet. Oh, we've only seen a, perhaps a glimpse of it. And, and, and Sean Kanuk, I must ask you, since you're a cybersecurity expert, the Russia question <laughs> and how you uh, view the Russian role in the US presidential election, overplayed or? Just right. So there's a question I've had the opportunity to discuss in several North American media outlets as well. I will simply say that I am most surprised at how many people are surprised <laughs> what has been brought forward. Uh, I think we live in a world where great powers conduct espionage against one another. Quite frankly, I'd be surprised if the Russian, the Chinese, or even some European intelligence services did not don't collect don't. information on U.S. politics. Uh, I think, from my personal expertise, I would accept the fact that Russia and Russian origin actors did uh, do the actions in question. Uh, I think that it is an unsettled issue of who exactly they may or may not have favored to win. As a strategist, I would offer that creating uncertainty or questions of illegitimacy in a competitor's domestic system would yield a benefit simply by forcing that other nation to need to focus on its internal politics and maybe not be able to project power, hard or soft, as effectively on the international sphere. If you're forced to look inward, you can't be contending outwardly. The final question, which has been a premier issue in the US media recently, is did it actually affect the outcome? And there I would say I don't believe it did. I think there were efforts at uh, influencing the U.S. media space possibly or creating this uncertainty or doubt, 
but I don't think it actually changed the tabulated votes or altered who was going to become the president based on our constitutional electoral college process. Interesting. Samit had a point. No, I just want you know, it was kind of ironic and funny that the Americans are complaining about regime change. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's something they made popular in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have Putin who perhaps has been accused of um, uh, intervening or interfering in U.S. domestic politics. It's probably payback time for the colored revolutions. And, and whether we're talking colored revolutions or Radio Free Europe and Voice of America, right. this is not something new. It's not new. We can go back to Greek city-states and hear about trying to influence the elections in each other. Don't be surprised that there's politics and that there's espionage. I think I think you're absolutely right. And the question then is, uh, Bernadetta, that what what happens now? I mean, in Europe, you have these key elections coming up. Yeah. Uh, and I actually, honestly, when the Brexit vote happened, and most of us didn't expect Brexit to happen, but I remember telling a lot of my friends, I think if this has happened, Trump, Trump can won't. happen. And now, uh, when you look at France, when you look at Germany, when you look at the Netherlands, do you see a possibility of far-right parties there? gaining uh, a strong foothold. It may not necessarily happen in France, but certainly there is an advantage there. Or did Austria teach us that it's not, it's not, a, closed, it's not, an, it's, it's not a closed chapter just yet? I'm afraid, I wish I could say that I think Austria shows that the waves of populism have gone from Europe, but I don't think that's the case. I think uh, there certainly is an undeniable, and this goes before Brexit precedes Donald Trump, there is a rise of populist movements within the European continent, there is a rise of xenophobic, uh, right-wing, ultra-right-wing political parties all across Europe. They have increased their political power, their crowds, their rhetoric, what is what they are allowed to get away with in the past decade has changed profoundly the political conversation in Europe has shifted in a way that discussing others um, in a far less tolerant and a welcoming way has now become politically acceptable I think that's unfortunately not going to go away going to go away anytime soon and uh, Europe is dealing with m a multitude of crises there is still uh, recovering from the economic crisis there is an int a uh, this integration crisis that we still haven't solved. There is Brexit, there is uh, terrorism, uh, there is the refugee crisis. They all intertwine and fundamentally I think what I think we should think about is that Europe is facing Id an ideal ideational crisis, meaning it's challenging the very same foundation and values upon which the European Union project was built. And I think that's why for me the refugee crisis and the way it was dealt with is so dramatic. Because on the one hand, you have Europe say we're built upon this foundation of inclusiveness and human rights, and that's what we stand for. And on the other hand, you have the reality of dealing with the refugee crisis in a way that resulted in the do, exact do you think someone opposite. like Angela Merkel can survive that? That's the problem. I think uh, the Angela Merkel connection is the right one because she stood up and she said, we need to fight for normative Europe. The right thing to do is to uh, to open our doors to refugees. And we have the financial resources to do it, which I agree with. I, but unfortunately, this brave moment wasn't, uh, didn't lead up to most European leaders to follow suit. If that would have happened, we'd be in a different situation. But what you are with today is basically Germany, along with Sweden, bury the brunt of the refugee crisis, and that creates pressures domestically that has, stu that has stoked uh, domestic nationalism. He has, he has created problems for Merkel that I'm, I'm not sure she, I think she will survive because I like to be an optimist. You believe she'll survive? I believe, she, well also the polls tell us she she's like still to ahead. Yeah. She's ahead, but this the time. margin is the margin is is wavering. Why is uh, why why are you <laughs> smiling, Sean? Because I'm thinking to the pre-Brexit and pre-U.S. presidential election polls. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who's and who's coming out saying? and answering the exactly. polls? Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right on that. Shashi Thru, there's an interesting point that she made there, where she said that you know Europe is becoming xenophobic. There's this rising intolerance, and that is now, as you said. Pol that's no, you, we don't feel the need to be politically correct anymore about these things. So, in other words, are we becoming a more is this becoming a more intolerant world? 
yeah, that we're living in. I mean, I think that World over. where I would slightly part company from Bernadette is I, I'm not sure there is a crisis of the European idea. I think many in the continent will say they like the European idea for Europeans. It's the foreigners they don't want. Yeah. <laughs> now, it so happens that on the other side of the channel, the, uh, the English uh, include in those foreigners all the <laughs> Europeans who yeah. are speaking East European <laughs> dialects on the streets of London. So essentially, it, there is this level of increasing resentment of immigration. Trump cashed in on that too. I mean, all his thing about keeping Muslims out of America and implying yeah. that Syrian refugees represented some sort of threat, whereas in fact, they're the most vetted and triple and quadruple vetted people who are ever allowed to set foot in the US. All of this plays into a suspicion of foreigners, which at least in many countries also feeds into the economic reality. If your jobs have disappeared on you, or at least your prospects are disappearing on you, then you tell yourself it's because those foreigners took the jobs away. And so xenophobia or hostility to foreigners, to immigrants, to refugees, all of that, actually turns out to be justified on economic grounds. In times of prosperity, people are relaxed. I mean, Europe's uh, good years of immigration from the point of view of the immigrants are when Europe was booming, when the economy was fine, people weren't worried. The moment the economy takes a downturn, suddenly suspicion of uh, foreigners, immigrants, other religions, other colors, all mounts.